Good day and welcome to Westchester Talk Radio. John Marino, we are called by Shark Creative. We are made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built by Michael Labriola, landscape design and construction of Armonk, by Hightower Westchester, managing your wealth to a fiduciary standard, and by Jaguar Land Rover of New Rochelle, White Plains, and Mount Pisco. We are joined on the sports report by Josh Thompson. Josh Thompson is the sports editor of the Journal News and the Poughkeepsie Journal. Keeps a close eye on high school athletics up and down the lower Hudson Valley. Josh, welcome back. It was quite an interesting winter sports season. I know we try to do things as best as possible, still considering the pandemic and in the end, some things never change. Mount Vernon wins the 12th all-time boys basketball state championship. Yeah, you know, uh, it was a really special team uh, they had, you know, only the third time in in program history and only the second time under Bob Semino that Mount Vernon has been an undefeated state champion. And the last time was in 2000 with Ben Gordon. That team finished as the number one team in the tri-state uh, you know, this team wasn't nearly as tested against other top tri-state teams, uh, partly due to, you know, schedule limitations, partly due to the fact that there was no uh, federation tournament this year where you play the Catholic champion and the nice uh, independent champion and the PSAL champion. But what Mount Vernon did that is really special is, you know, won every game put in front of it and, you know, really played well as a team. This is one of the best uh, teams I've seen Samino had in terms of, you know, maybe not the huge star power that some of his past state championship teams has ha- had had, but this team is really deep, you know, could play eight, nine, 10 players without really any drop off at all. And, uh, you know, it was a really impressive run. They beat two very good teams up in Glens Falls and beat a very solid uh, uh, Newburgh team, which was the section nine champion um, in, in the regional. So, you know, this was a, a really uh, impressive year and, you know, in, in the process, Bob Semino now with uh, the 24 wins for this year's team has uh, 576 all-time uh, tying Lou Panzanero peak skill for the most all-time in uh, Section 1 in Westchester County uh, for boys basketball. So it was a really special year for Mount Vernon. And, and the difference, like you said, you know, some things change, some things remain the same. The difference this time was I don't think a lot of people saw this one coming. This was a team that, you know, played a shortened season last year due to COVID, just 11 games. Uh, started the year off one and three, uh, lost to Mamaronek, uh, lost to Nourishel. You know, just wasn't really the Mount Vernon team that that uh, that you've seen over the years. And returned a lot of players from that team. That team did play well at the end of last season. But, you know, had a couple players emerge big time this year. Elijah Morris, a junior, you know, who I think will end up being a Division One player after next year. And then you have Brandon Sinclair, a kid who didn't play uh, as a junior due to COVID, he's six foot nine. And I think one day we'll 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 look back and, and you'll say, wow, he, he played at Mount Vernon. I think it'll be that kind of player. You know, he'll go to a junior college or a prep school and he'll be a division one player as well. And I think, you know, those two guys kind of coming on the way they did turn this team into something special. And um, you know, it was really it was really exciting to watch and ended up, you know, being kind of a great culmination to to the season. You know, I happen to be the public address announcer out of Bridgehampton on Long Island. They are number two all time in New York State in championships, one with nine. And they went to the state elite eight in class D this year. They won the Suffolk County Championship. And yet I could see the disappointment. I think the right result happened in the elite eight game against the team from uh, section nine, and that team was better than Bridgehampton. That's why Bridgehampton lost. And let you could see the this is you could just see the disappointment amongst the people in Bridgehampton that we should have won. Is this the same expectation in Mount Vernon? Why teams like this win so much? They just expect to win every year. You know the answer to that. I I, I can tell you resoundingly is no, and I think that's probably would be surprising for for people to hear that. But I can tell you that. Bob Semino, and I think this is one of the great reasons for all his success, he does not take winning ever lightly, meaning to win a Section 1 championship to him is extremely special. He considers that the number one goal of his program every year, to win a Section 1 championship, to win a gold ball. Now, he has appeared. It's an incredible stat. Of all his amazing stats, it's the most incredible by far. He's a, his team has appeared in every Section 1 final 
since 1999. Everyone since then, which is amazing, over 20 years, and has I believe he's only lost in five of them. So I mean, this is basically meaning every year since 1999, with the exception of a, a handful. You know, his team has achieved its its first goal. So that that's what he sets as the first goal. And then there are other things that that go along with it, winning state titles, which he's done now eight times, federation titles four times. And that's, you know, that that's the way that he kind of views things. It's not a uh, – maybe it is an expectation to win, but it's not a given. It's not something that they look at as as uh, something that they expect to, to come out of Section 1 every year and compete for a state title. They do – they are fulfilled by that. They are, you know, kind of excited by that still. And, you know, I think that's because of the tone that he sets – uh, with the program. And I think it's, you know, one of the major reasons why he's been so successful. Why is Bob Samino not in the Westchester sports hall of fame yet? Great question. I'm told he's never been nominated. Um, yeah, as far as I know, I think that that somebody should, should get on that. And, and if it's not somebody from Mount Vernon, I know that there are people who are involved with the Westchester sports hall of fame that do nominate people. And he would be somebody who should be nominated. Mm, yeah, I've spoken to a few people around Mount Vernon about trying to get something going for Bob Semino. He just has to be in there. Hopefully, the sooner, the better. By the way, it was Chapel Field from Pine Bush that right. defeated Bridgehampton in Section 9 in the Class D Elite 8, as it turned out. Now, what were the other highlights of the winter sports season to you? Basketball, wrestling, etc. Well, you know, you have uh, certainly in... Uh, basketball, we'll kind of we'll kind of start there. You had some some really uh, strong performances, teams making to the Final Four and State Final that I think were a bit of a surprise. So you have the Tappan Z girls. You know they made the state championship game for the first time ever, which is a huge achievement for that program. And you know their their coach um, Riley uh, Chevrolet. She used to be Riley Harrington, old point guard at uh, at Irvington. Not old either. She's maybe thirty. Um, and she's obviously done a great job with that with that program. And, you know, I think that'll be a team that'll be successful for a long time. You had the Putnam Valley girls making to the final four for the first time. Uh, you had Poughkeepsie boys. And again, you know, Cody Moffitt, unbelievable coach, you know, in his fourth year at Poughkeepsie. Every year he's basically taken a new team, a different team to a championship. They won section one in class A, which was super deep, probably could have had seven or eight teams could have won that tournament. Uh, his team won after beating Lord's team that lost that beat it that beat Poughkeepsie twice during the regular season, and then the Pioneers made the Final Four. And you know, if they graduate a bunch of seniors, they'll be back. He's an awesome coach, and, and it just kind of shows you, you know, kind of the impact a coach can have on a program. Poughkeepsie obviously had had a lot of success over the years, the boys, um, but you know, I think they're in, they're in run for a very very you know long, however long he's there you know, just sustained success year after year, perhaps even maybe eventually similar to like a Mount Vernon where, where they're mm -hmm. there kind of every year. Um, so, so you had, you had instances like that. You had a catch them uh, from Dutchess County, won the class double A girls championship first time ever. Pat Mealy, who's won some, uh, some state and section titles as a baseball coach. Uh, and he, he's the coach there at catch him. And that was, that was a bit of an upset, I think. So you had some teams that, that did some great things. Hamilton got back on top winning a, a great uh, Class C boys final against Haldane, a team that was uh, number one, uh, you know, number one seed entering. Um, you had YMA from from Yonkers, a really, really nice story. Ellie Moyes, the head coach there, winning a, a gold ball. And Anthony Nicodemo getting his first with uh, Greenberg North Castle after all. Uh, some years of success at Saunders, hadn't quite been able to get over the top. So they won the Class D boys title. So, you know, so definitely some exciting things there. But then Obviously, I think the main highlight, other than maybe Mount Vernon winning a state title from the winter, is you had two Section 1 hockey teams win state championships. I believe there had only ever been three state champions total from Section 1 previously. And um, you had Suffern win Division 1 and Pelham win Division 2. Incredible story. You know, we, well, I hate, I tell our reporters, I hate when teams are co-number ones to end the season or, or co-players of the year because I, I think you have to make a tough choice. This was a different story. These teams played each other twice during the regular season. You know, I think Suffern was the favorite, but Pelham earned a split, won one of those games. I believe the game is in, in Monsey, in Rockland. And then they both go on to win state championships in pretty thrilling fashion. Uh, Pelham in overtime. You know, I think, I think that to me is, you know, when you look at the sports season as a whole, 
you know, has to be the number one highlight. You know, it, it kind of shows something that's been happening, which is hockey has been taking a really strong foothold over the course of the last decade or two in this region. And I think, you know, now with those teams being number one in the state in their divisions and winning state titles, to me, that kind of that kind of stands out the most uh, from the mm-hmm. winter. Yeah, suffering and the program they've had and the program that Mike Schiaparelli has had over at Mamaroneck for a long time on the ice. Really gotten hockey into the forefront, not as much as basketball, but high up on the rungs of interest throughout Section 1, throughout the lower Hudson Valley over the last decade, 15 years or so, like you said. You know, Bronxville basketball, boys basketball, and they won Class B. I saw but them on I, you know, tape. I forgot to mention them, John. That, that yeah, was, you know, I saw them on tape yeah. a couple of times, and I looked at, I watched full games on tape, and I say to myself, what am I looking at here? Because I see them live and in person, and it looks like a totally different team in person on the court as to what you see on tape, at least to me. And that's not usually the case. Shows you how good they are and decept- how deceptive of, of a team they were, too. Well, I have to give uh, their coach and their players a lot of credit for that. Um, and, and the reason is, you know, Bobby Russo, he's a, a Stepanak guy. Um, he had been the varsity B coach at Stepanak. And, you know, I had kind of known him before he got the job at, at Bronxville. He's a, I've known his father, Ralph Russo, for a long time because he was in a former assistant coach over at Stepanak. And, um, you know, I, I knew the, I know the guy who he used to coach with very well, Tim Philp, who's now Cardinal Hayes. and you know, so I've known the Russo family for a long time and they're, they're easy people to root for. They're very nice people. They do things for the right reason. Um, but I have to say from a coaching standpoint, this is pretty impressive because I feel like the last few years with the current team he had now, they were, they had a little more maybe skill than this year's team and played a little different style this year's team, And this is what you have to do. This is the difference between coaching at a Catholic or private school and coaching at a public school. When you coach at a public school, you coach the players who walk through the door. And this year's Bronxville team had some big physical players, headlined by their star player, Chris Kelty, 1,000-point scorer. He's a football, basketball player who who could go to play either in college. And then Connor O'Neill, who who this was first year on the basketball court, um, but he's a guy who's going to Georgetown to play football, Uh, you know, a very talented football player. He was a Class B co-player of the year in football. And he kind of came in and, you know, again, to the Russo's credit, embraced a totally different role, never shot the ball, but he kind of played a, 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 a real bruising style. And I mm-hmm. think with those guys up front and some, some really good guard play, Finn Ruhannon played a great championship game. Uh, uh, Tim McGrath, you know, played great in the playoffs, had some big games. He had, I think he had a, a game where he had six three-pointers or five three-pointers against Rondout Valley and regionals. So the, and he had a great championship game as well. So, so these are guys who, who were skilled and could play well, but they were kind of up in your face creating steals, especially Finn Ruhannon, and that kind of fit in well with the style that they were playing. But it was a little bit of a different style than some of the Bronxville teams that have been successful since Russo came in and kind of took that program to a different level. And lo and behold, it resulted in the first championship for, for the program in 40 years. Mm-hmm. And frankly, Going to the championship game against Briarcliff, I think that was a 50-50 toss-up game. Briarcliff had a 50-50 toss-up game against Hastings right. in, in the semifinals. I think all three of those teams, any of them could have won it. Bronxville had a tough uh, semifinal game against a very good Edgemont team, who I think you know know pretty well and you know had a, had a good team. And, and, so, and that was a close game. That was a very close game. So, so this was not a Bronxville team that was heads and shoulders above its competition, but – when the time came, played great games, and especially in that championship game, you know, this was a team that, that you know, really took it to Briarcliff, you know, which had, had been right there, I think, throughout the regular season. So that was impressive. Then won its regional game and then almost beat a very good Friends Academy team in the regional final. So, you know, absolute, you know, credit to, to Russo. You know, I know that it's one of those years where if I think Semino hadn't done what he had done, he would have had a great chance to be our coach of the year because it was that kind of season for Bobby Russo and, and Bronxville. And, you know, they deserve a lot of credit for, like I said, kind of changing the way the team played and just being as successful or even more successful, which is really impressive. And that's what the best coaches do. They adapt to what they have as opposed to saying, you play my style or you can't play here. That's right. And, you know, that that's something that we've seen from Mount Vernon over the years where they actually have had some teams that were bigger 
and maybe not as quick as usual. And then this year's team was more of the quick variety, you know, a bunch of guards who could play, and they played a different style. They were playing half-court man-to-man pretty much all game long, up in people's faces. And, you know, that is the adjustment you have to make, especially at a public school where, you know, you're you're kind of just playing the cards you're dealt. And, and I think it was impressive uh, what Bronxville was able to do for that reason. And by the way, my friends at Bridgehampton always say to me a few times per year, they say, number one, say hi to our old friends at Alexander Hamilton. And you talked about their return to prominence of Hamilton. We miss them. And two, when will basketball be back at the county center in White Plains? Because when we go to scout, we know our way to White Plains. Sure. Yeah. You know, John, I don't know. It's a great question there. You know, the, the, the federal government's finally going to be moving out of the building, at, I think, at some point next month. Um, so that certainly will help. And then it's just going to be uh, depend on when they can get the building back online. Um, you know, I, I've been told that it's going to be a lot of a lot of months, many months and, you know, cost a lot of money. There's some damage that was done, you know, when they when they uh, turned the building into a makeshift hospital, um, you know, back back in 2020. Um, you know, just holes being, you know, punctured in the ceiling, the walls to run water lines, gas lines and things like that. Things you need to run a, run a hospital. And I think that that's going to take a good amount of time and money. Uh, there will probably be some question at first about who's going to pay for that, I would think. Right. Um, so, so those are those are things that are going to happen. And is, is it going to be ready by next February to host basketball? I don't know. You know, we'll have to see. I, I don't know even that the county um, and this is just, you know, my own speculation, but but does the county even know what to expect? You know, they've been right. out of there for a long time now, John. It's been almost, basically it's been two years, right? Since about right. eight. It's been two years. I've heard maybe yeah. a year, maybe more like two years before we can get basketball back there again. Right, right. So I think it's going to be a while. I think if, you know, I think if the basketball tournament was played next summer, I'd probably be more optimistic. But, you know, February is not that long when you're talking about May 31st, right? Uh, the federal government, you know, get, leaving the building, I think it's the end of the month. So, uh, I, I think I think that'll be uh, that'll be something that'll take a little while. And I, yeah, I, I wouldn't say I'm optim- overly optimistic about there being games for next February. But again, you never know if it's a, if it takes you know seven eight months and they want to open it with a bang. Maybe maybe they'll be ready to to do it next February. But but it's also it's hard for me to see Section One committing at some point, you know, early enough where they can say, yeah, that's going to be a place that's going to be open and available for for us to play. But, you know, we'll find, I think, more out about it probably, you know, in June or July over the summer, and we'll see, you know, kind of what the county says about its timeline for the county center. Josh Thompson is the sports editor over at the Journal News and Poughkeepsie Journal that covers high school sports up and down the Hudson Valley. Josh Thompson here on Sports Report. Westchester Talk Radio. I'm John Marino. Josh, let's turn our attentions to the spring. I know the weather has gotten in the way a number of times already this spring with a lot of the activity and action so far. Who do you think are the key players in the major sports this spring and who might be out there that we might see in college next year or maybe, let's say, in Major League Baseball a few years down the road? Yeah, you know, so so from a, a baseball standpoint, it's um, I don't know that that there, there's quite it's only been, you know, a third of the season so far that a lot of favorites have emerged. You know, there, there's been there's been so much uh, turnover in the last couple of years. You know, there were no sec, uh, no um, state playoffs last year. There were sectionals, obviously. Uh, you know, one team definitely to watch is Panis, though. Um, you know, I think five Division One commits. Uh, all over the diamond. A lot of them actually are juniors. They have one senior, Aiden Kohal, going to St. John's. You have Danny Witters committed to Stetson, a catcher. You have uh, uh, Sam Sephora, a shortstop, who's committed uh, to Clemson. You know, obviously a, a baseball power there. You have, um, you know, Tony Humphrey, who transferred from Iona Prep uh, back home to Panis. He's committed to Boston College. Right. Um, and then, obviously, the last one I'm mentioning is maybe in terms of college is the lowest level commit, but making a probably the biggest impact because he's an ace pitcher. And that's uh, Jackson DiLorenzo is committed to East Carolina. He's a junior. Um, he just threw a shutout last week to be Arlington, who might be the favorite in class double A, certainly up there in class double A. Um, he, he shut them out. I think he struck out 12 in that game. So, you know, they're, they're a team that's going to be a team to watch. That's a class A team. But you have a lot of other Class A teams that are undefeated or close right now. Rise undefeated. East Chester's undefeated. Byron Hills just lost its first game last night. 
but has been terrific and may have Section 1's best pitcher, Boston College commit Bobby Chacoin, uh, big right-hander, throws hard. Um, so so they're, they're, those are a lot of those teams to beat in Class A. And then Class Double, I mentioned, you had Arlington, which was unbeaten outside of that loss, uh, to, to Panis. Um, you have Ketchum, which got off to a tough start. Pat Mealy got suspended for a couple of games based on an incident at the end of the basketball season where he, he kind of um, got very upset at, at, at Lourdes, you know, put in some, some protocols that prevented – the Ketchum fans from coming to a playoff game, basketball game, and ended up being suspended for a couple of games. So they lost a couple of games earlier this year to, to Clarkstown South, uh, but I think they'll bounce back. They have Owen Pano, uh, Panio, who's the um, committed to Ole Miss. He's a, a 10th grader who is among the best 10th graders in the country. This is a kid who will probably be drafted one day, uh, you know, pretty high. He, he's a shortstop and a pitcher. So, so that's a team to watch out for as always. And then Suffern and Clarkstown South from Rockland, both off to great starts. Um, Suffern is, has really hit the ball well. Um, lineup is very strong top to bottom. And then you can't forget Carmel defending class double-A champ, uh, which graduated almost its entire team outside of Kevin Dahl, starting shortstop, who's the quarterback on the state championship team. And Carmel's, uh, I think they're eight and four off to a great start, had, has some quality wins. So a lot of, lot of teams to watch out for in double-A and A. Uh, Panis is just a team I think that will kind of excite people just because of the Division One talent level. So I think you'll you'll see a lot from them. And then uh, another uh, team I should mention is uh, Kennedy Catholic, uh, probably the most talented team in the region. Gary Gill Hill, uh, big right-handed pitcher. Uh, he's actually from Wallkill, comes over to Kennedy every day, and he's uh, throwing in the 90s. He's got two no-hitters already, and he's backed up by Russell Hunter, a commit um, – to Hofstra and Louis Marinero, who coming back from Tommy John surgery, he's a commit to St. John's. So that's the level of pitching staff you have right there. Three Division I pitchers. Uh, Nick Mazzotta, their shortstop, committed to FDU. Uh, he, he's a terrific player as well. So, so Kennedy's loaded, but Iona Prep and Stepanak both having solid seasons. Um, you know, th- there'll be teams to watch uh, coming up. Uh, Iona Prep has a sophomore pitcher, Ryan Bailey from Rockland County. He's a, a Division I commit, already committed to West Point. You know, they also have Peter Fasiglione, shortstop committed to Notre Dame. Jimmy Keenan, a catcher and first baseman and really just a power hitter who's committed to St. John. So always a, a loaded roster at Iona Prep. And, you know, so so Iona and Stepanak will be teams to watch in the Catholic League this year. So I think there's a lot of baseball talent out there right now. So if you like good pitching, uh, good catchers in particular, you know, uh, there's a lot of people out there to watch. I and I just totally forgot Adam Agresti, a junior catcher at Kennedy. He might be the best position player of them all right now. So he's committed to St. John's also. So there's just a lot of baseball town out there in the region uh, right now. And Kennedy, always a top team every year. Do around section one this year, do you get the impression? And I get this impression on Long Island, certainly knowing all the leagues out there where I know one league, for, for example, where you have seven teams and the top three teams are all six and two, seven and one, eight and oh, and everybody else doesn't have a win yet this season. Is there too much top heaviness around section one that way right now, maybe as a result of the pandemic? Well, I, I don't think it's a result of a pandemic. I think it's more of a result of this is, you know, been going on for years where there are, are towns where Athletes specialize in certain sports or favor certain sports. Those towns have strong feeder programs. Those kids play travel, soccer, lacrosse, or basketball or baseball. And and they that just gives them, you know, a a bigger leg up in the competition. And, you know, I don't think it's uh, any surprise that suffering hockey is good every year or Mount Vernon basketball is good every year. Or, you know, in lacrosse, it's it's Yorktown, it's John Jay, it's Rye, and now it's Bronxville, it's Briarcliff, you know. You mentioned before about teams that are really good, you know, Bronxville and Briarcliff, you know, their teams and in, in, in boys across that compete for could compete for state titles this year, you know, and it's the same with the Bronxville girls. You know, they've been up there for a while. Rye, you know, you look at Rye now, football, lacrosse, baseball, very strong. They're strong every year. You know, you graduate Declan Lavelle and Sean Thompson, two aces who are pitching in college, you know, excellent play. There's just more pitching at Rye. There's always another quarterback at Rye. There's always another, you know, attackman at Rye. You know, Caden Whaling and, and Owen Kovacs, they're football stars or lacrosse stars for them, Division One players. They're great, 
there will be people behind them eventually at Rye. And it's no disrespect to them. They're, they're awesome athletes, but it's just kind of the way it is. And, and, you know, you see that from different sports. And I think what happens, though, is while those programs remain strong over time, you know, the, the teams that the schools that don't have those strong, that strong lacrosse program, that strong baseball program, it's very hard for them to compete, you know, year in and year out. Yeah, there's sometimes you might have some good players or a good team. But, you know, year in and year out, there are certain teams that have strong traditions and programs. And I, I think that is a, a big part of year round sports specialization. You know, things like that have, have created a, even a larger gulf probably in high school sports uh, and certainly c- certainly certain sports where where travel ball and travel teams and, you know, off season training are, are really important. About 20 years ago. 25 years ago, we had an old adage around the section and around the county, around Westchester, that lacrosse didn't matter that much below 287. That changed a bit. Bronxville is a great program, boys and girls, for a number of years now. Irvington has gotten a lot better. Rye has gotten a lot better. Harrison, too. White Plains has made lacrosse strides among other schools. Is it still pretty much that way, though, like above 287? It's kind of like being out on Long Island where lacrosse right after basketball and football is king. And Jimmy Brown, for example, is the best all-time lacrosse player in Long Island history, probably New York State college history, too, up at Syracuse as well. And yet below 287, it still may not be that big. Although you go around the Maranek, Larchmont, you see the league there, all the kids who are in that. I was just going to say, you know, Maranek has dominated the Class A uh, tournament, the boys, for, for a decent amount of time here now. I mean, they, they've yeah. been – I don't have the exact number, but they've won most of the Class A championships. And, you know, that doesn't include Yorktown and John Jay and Rye, but it does include some pretty strong programs, including Lakeland Panis and Mayapak that have been strong, you know, for decades. And now Mamaradek has kind of taken over that that classification. Certainly Rye is, you know, right down there in that 287 corridor. Right. And you go around the Mamaradek Larchmont, you see the difference now with lacrosse there in the last decade or so, how much of an impact that sport makes there and how much in the community they built that sport up. And the other, the other one I would say really strong is Bronxville. You know, Bronxville yep. has had a lot of multi. They're still, they're you know, they're a small school and similar to Rye, still thriving on multi-sport athletes. Kids aren't just specializing; they might specialize in lacrosse, but they're also playing football or they're also playing basketball. And they 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 have been able to keep you know some of that, which I think is a part of the reason those schools are so successful. But certainly, Bronxville has you know they've become a factory for producing college lacrosse players and, you know, really strong teams. And, you know, just north of 287, Briarcliff and Pleasantville have, have done a good job as well. So, you know, it's definitely not just Northern Westchester, uh, Putnam, which, which it was for a long time. I think it is expanding. It's kind of like, you know, what we were talking about with hockey before. It, it, it's, it takes a while for, you know, some, a sport that wasn't traditionally played in an area to take a foothold. You have to have rinks. You have to have lacrosse travel programs. You have to have youth programs. And, and once those are put in place, you know, strong coaching. And once those things are put in place, it takes a while for it to kind of have an impact. But I, I think it's definitely starting to, at least in some towns. You go, for example, to a Bronxville lacrosse game and, or a Westlake game in Class B, for example, and you could go to five or six different games back-to-back over two or three days in Class B, just using that as an example, then show up at Bronxville or at Westlake and watch the difference, how good these two teams are. It's like it's just like they're like whirling dervishes out there, and as good as some of these other teams might be in Class B right now. You get to Bronxville, you get to Westlake, that's just a different level of play, and then you move up the ladder with the bigger schools and you just see the difference there and you talk about how these programs have to be developed. And I guess it applies to every sport. Like you said, some schools, some communities specialize in some sports and they may not pay as much attention to other sports. And yet it's vice versa in different communities around section one and around the lower Hudson Valley too. And Oh, by the way, it was great in the final four, the NCAA final four to see two Stepanak kids go head to head. Yeah, sure. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're both great players, both all Americans. You know, I don't think it was a huge surprise. I mean, uh, yeah, North Carolina, you know, got there, the seed got there as, you know, wasn't a team that had an amazing season, but it played pretty well down the stretch, including a big win over Duke. And, you know, RJ Davis is a, he is a born winner. He's a tough kid. He is 
super smart. You know, he's an ace, was an A student in high school. I have no idea what his GPA is in North Carolina, but I'm sure it's pretty good uh, based on, you know, what he had done academically at Stepanak. And, you know, he is just somebody who, who knows how to play. You know, there were some of those games along the way, the Baylor game really sticks out in my mind where he was on an island. There wasn't a lot of help um, because the team had, you know, foul trouble, had, you know, the one player who was ejected, you know, just had a lot of things that had kind of gone wrong. And, you know, he just is a, a kid who kind of knows how to get it done and, and make plays and, you know, be productive. And um, AJ Griffin, I think is still learning some of the things that RJ Davis is, 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 has done and is already doing, but he's just blessed with incredible talent. Um, you know, he's six, seven, he's an NBA body. He shoots the ball amazingly well. Uh, he did not play great in, in the final four, uh, for sure. And, you know, he had a couple other games along the way there where he probably wasn't at, at his best. Um, but he's a guy who at the next level is going to be a rotation player in the NBA. Is he going to be a star? You know, I think that kind of is up to him. I think sometimes, though, people forget he's 18 years old. You know, Chet Holmgren, for example, is 20 years old. Right. So it's, it's a different – A.J. turned 18 years old last August. So he's very young. He's a lot younger than – he'll probably be one of the youngest players in the, in the NBA draft this year. You know, I assume he's going to go out. I'm not, I'm not making any, uh, any predictions, but, you know, I assume he's going to go pro. He, he's projected to be a lottery pick. You know, financially, it just wouldn't make sense for him to come back, certainly with his injury history. Uh, but he's just a guy with, with incredible amount of talent. Um, he found a role there this year. He stayed healthy, John. That was the most important thing. You know, he hasn't played much the last three years. He did not play a lot of games as a sophomore, junior, and senior. Did not played all as a senior. Um, junior and, and sophomore year, he played fewer than 50% of the games that Stepanak played, you know, had, had ankle problems. And, you know, there were just, there were just a lot of issues that he, and knee problems that he had to endure. And it was great to see him stay on the court. And I think it was just natural. As soon as he got on the court, it was, it was natural that he was going to play better. And just like, I think that whether he stays at Duke or goes to the NBA, like I said, I assume he's going to go to the NBA. It's hard for me to believe if he stays healthy, that he's not going to continue to get better. I do think, though, that what the tournament, uh, you know, said to me is, you know, maybe R.J. Davis is going to be an NBA player one day, too. I mean, here's a guy who can, you know, was playing off the ball basically for a year and a half. And Caleb Love was on the ball, five-star recruit, top 10 uh, player, McDonald's All-American, came in with more hype than than R.J. did, certainly. You know, he kind of had the ball for a year and a half. But when it switched over and it became kind of RJ's team to run the offense, he he showed what he could do and they went to another level. And, you know, he's certainly going to have to do that if he wants to play in the NBA at, at six feet, 175 pounds, maybe. Um, you know, he's going to have to do that. But I think that, you know, uh, he certainly is coming back next year but I, I to North Carolina. But I, I think he certainly opened up some eyes and I'm sure he'll get some looks and, you know, he'll need a great year next year to kind of um, – to, to kind of follow up on that, but, but they have a lot of players coming back. So it'll be fun to see both those guys, you know, it was great to see them in the final four. It'll be a lot of fun to see what those guys can do going forward now, because I think there's a lot of reason to be excited for both of them. Will Gonzaga's Holmgren be the top pick overall? Uh, you know, I don't know if I would pick him number one. Um, I agree I, with you on that. I like Paulo Benchero from Duke. Um, you know, I, I, Holmgren's body scares me. You know, he looks, he looks like Kevin Durant, but there's only one Kevin Durant. Right. And so I think that while his skills are, are really impressive, you know, I think when you look at his, uh, his results against quality competition this year, against ranked teams, and, and I don't know that he had that many great games. And he certainly was struggling against uh, Jalen Durant from Memphis, who's, you know, probably a fellow lottery pick this year, but is a big, strong kid. And, uh, you know, physically he, he struggled to, to, to get quality shots off against him and to score. So, um, you know, and then I, I, you kind of look at the way the NBA is, is headed with, you know, big guys who can handle the ball and make plays. And Holmgren and has shoot. some of that, but I think Benchero probably has more of it. And, you know, right. he's a little more versatile. And, you know, a lot of seven-footers get played off the floor now in the NBA, especially in the playoffs. So um, it would be interesting to see what, what happens there. You know, it could just depend on who gets the first pick, though, what the fit is and, you know, I, I certainly think if you're Detroit, you'd probably take Chet Holmgren over over Benchero because Benchero and um, uh, Kate Cunningham have some similarities. So, 
you know, but, but we'll see what happens. It'll be very fascinating, I think, to see all those guys and how they progress. I think it's a lot different than it was 20 years ago because you see so such little of these guys in college, maybe 30 games, and maybe 10 of those games are against good teams. I mean, how many times did Chet Holmgren play against, uh, you know, guys who weren't going to be accountants in a right. couple of years? You know, so right. so it doesn't play like Kansas or Kentucky every night, for example. And, that, and that's no insult to to Pepperdine or right. yeah. Portland or so. But those guys are great athletes. Uh, but you know, it's it's you know these guys only go head to head against other top players a handful of times. Now I know scouts see them in AAU and you know USA basketball camp, which you know AJ Griffin was a part of a couple of years ago. And you know, I know they get a good look at them that way, but. You know, certainly you don't get as many opportunities and they don't get as many opportunities to showcase themselves. And, you know, it's a good thing and a bad thing. It's good for some of them because, you know, you can make a lot of money based on your potential um, without having to really prove it too much. I don't think against against top guys. Um, but for teams, it's got to be scary. You know, you, you, you end up only got to base, you know, what you're going to do on a, on a handful of games against fellow NBA caliber talent. So and uh, I, I know yeah. while we have you here, too, the Jets and Giants, round one. What do you think they'll both do? They both have two picks. They can't get these wrong. They have so many needs, both teams. I mean, the Giants have such a long way to go. So they have – they're in, they're in cap uh, purgatory. You know, they have so many so many needs. Um, you know, I've seen people talk about them maybe even trading some of their picks and getting more picks. Might not be a bad idea. They're, 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 they're sending guys out who are good players, some of the only good players they have. Because they can't afford to keep all of them, and right? Bradbury's trading. next, I guess. Oh, Bradbury right. now, likely yeah. be traded. Yeah, right. He'll likely be traded. So they have so many things to replace. So I think that's the main thing with them. And you know, I think I think it's a little different pressure on the Jets because you have you know some of the same people in charge, and I think you have you know now you're on another new quarterback. He didn't look great. It, it's kind of time to make take the next step. And the Jets actually had money to spend. So I think that you know they if if either team is good this year. It should be the Jets out of those two. Um, but the question is now, is, is Zach Wilson good? And are they going to be good? And, you know, I think we'll, we'll find out. But you can't, you know, things do shift in the NFL. If the, thing, if the schedule lines up right and free agency lines up right and you hit on a couple of picks, you can get good pretty quick. So, Josh Thompson, sports editor, Journal News, for Tipsy Journal. We thank you, as always, here on Westchester Talk Radio, the Sports Report. Talk to you next time around, Josh. Thanks. Hey, Chuck. All right, take care. Josh Thompson here, Westchester Talk Radio, produced by Shark Creative. I'm John Marino, and we are made possible by Robeson Oil, the house that service built by Michael Labriola, landscape design and construction of our month, by Hightower Westchester, managing your well to a fiduciary standard, and by Jaguar Land Rover of White Plains, New Rochelle, and Mount Kisco. Catch all of our Westchester, Rockland, Putnam, and Dutchess. Orange and Fairfield County Talk Radio programming on our YouTube channel. And that is Shark Creative YouTube. And we have an app now to take it with you anywhere and everywhere you go. Download it at Westchester Talk, courtesy of Shark Creative. 